Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. It is Sunday morning, April the 28th, 2019. And I was just trying to figure out what people are saying about boxing, what the mood is out there, what you fight fans are thinking. So I was watching some videos here on YouTube, and I was shocked. There are a bunch of videos that claim that Luis Ortiz and other fighters are somehow conspiring to duck Anthony Joshua, right? That was the thesis. Uh, the best video out there making this claim is uh, from my colleague, Boxing Wave, who does great work here online. I follow his stuff. And let me just say, I'm absolutely astonished. Um, I see absolutely no scenarios. One man's opinion, every opinion matters. I see absolutely no scenarios where fighters are even contemplating avoiding Anthony Joshua simply because this is prize fighting. And Anthony Joshua, quite frankly, is the biggest lion box office wise in the jungle right now, right? Understand other guys have shares of the heavyweight title, but not the shares that Anthony Joshua has, right? You can be the WBC champion. You could be the lineal champion, right? But Anthony Joshua has several of the other belts. Not only that, Anthony Joshua, if you look at his resume, Right? He's the one who beat Vladimir Klitschko. He's the one who beat an unbeaten Joseph Parker. He's the one who's already beaten Dylan White, who right now is one of the premier contenders. Right, So Anthony Joshua has a resume that gives him credibility. I believe Luis Ortiz and other fighters want a part of the spotlight. Think about it, too. Ortiz is an older heavyweight. He doesn't have a lot of time. So he wants to fight the biggest fish he can get in the water. Right? He wouldn't be saying, hey, I'm going to boycott Anthony Joshua. What's the point of that? So understand what, in my opinion, is really hanging up. The negotiations between, let's say, Ortiz and Anthony Joshua, or Joshua and other top heavyweights for his scheduled play date in New York City, right? These other guys know that Joshua is getting $30 million, $30 million for the fight. Not 20, not 25, $30 million for the fight. These other guys know that Joshua is the one in the pinch. Understand, guys have plausible deniability. A guy like Adam Konaki can say, look, it's too short notice. I have other commitments. And fans will buy that. Right? Take a guy like Konaki, too, for a second. Just to understand, this guy, I'm sure, has been dreaming of fighting for the heavyweight title for quite some time. He wants to make sure he's ready for his shot. Because all of these guys know a loss is perilous. A loss pushes you to the back of the line among contenders. Doesn't it? So let me say this too. You know, Gerald Miller was getting $6.5 to fight Anthony Joshua. At least that's how they sold it to us, the boxing public. Let's all understand that that's only part of the deal. Right? The Joshua people are wisely protecting their investment. This is the bargaining leverage that being heavyweight champion gives you, quite frankly. And they're saying, hey, let's talk about if our guy loses what the terms of the rematch are. Understand, according to reports, and these fighters are around, members of the boxing press can talk to them directly, right? According to reports, Dylan White 
was willing to fight for what they offered him on the front end. He just wanted to make sure that if he beat Joshua, then he would get the lion's share on the back end. Right? According to reports, Dylan White said, okay, look, if this is the offer you're going to make to me for the first fight, then for the rematch, I just want these terms flipped. In other words, what I'm getting for the first fight, you get for the rematch. Understand, the rematch only happens if the opponent beats Anthony Joshua. Right? The idea of a rematch presumes that the opponent beats Joshua in the first fight. So Dylan White said, hey, I'll take X for the first fight if you take X for the rematch. You can get Y for the first fight if I get Y for the rematch. The Joshua people said no. So I know there are reports that Luis Ortiz was offered more than $6.5 million and that somehow, you know, he turned it down and stuff like that. Folks, in negotiations like this, the devil is in the details. Right? They said to Luis Ortiz, hey, we'll offer you this, but there's more to the deal. You pull the upset. Here's what you'd get for the rematch. That's the way the conversation went. It wasn't a one-off conversation. If you're an investor in Anthony Joshua, and understand, the investment is huge in Joshua, the zone as Joshua as one of its flagship fighters, along with Canelo, right? You don't want to lose that investment on a lucky punch in a fight. That's why champs talk about rematch clauses. It's risk management. It's not that Joshua feels he's going to get stopped by Luis Ortiz or Dylan White. It's just that there's so much money invested in these guys that the investors are trying to protect their investment. Right? Tyson Fury signed a huge deal with ESPN. You think ESPN wants to suddenly have Fury lose the heavyweight title and not have some kind of backup plan, some kind of rematch clause in a contract? So let me say this, too. I've heard it said that Luis Ortiz can't sell tickets like Jarrell Miller can in New York City. Who came up with that one? That's patently absurd. Understand, the people in New York already saw Ortiz hold his own against an unbeaten heavyweight champion in Deontay Wilder. Who in Jarrell Miller's life has he fought who was an unbeaten heavyweight champion? Folks, Ortiz has the more meaningful resume, right? Pushing a guy at a press conference and talking smack doesn't sell a fight as well as actual past performance and reputation, right? So, so any idea that somehow Jarrell Miller carries more box office in New York City with him Then Luis Ortiz, in my opinion, needs to be kicked to the curb. At a minimum, that argument is unproven. Right? Jarrell Miller is not a huge box office draw. Jarrell Miller doesn't have the super fight experience in front of New York City fans that Luis Ortiz does, right? Simply does it. Didn't when he was offered six and a half million dollars. Understand too, I know Eddie Hearn has been talking about how Andy Ruiz would be a tough opponent, would at least come to fight Anthony Joshua. I think Andy Ruiz is a legitimate opponent. 
right? Legitimate. I feel much more strongly about Andy Ruiz than I do Jarrell Miller. Right? No question about that. But understand, this is typical in negotiations. They understand the guy with the higher profile with New York fans is Luis Ortiz. They want the people they're negotiating with, Michael Hunter, whoever, to understand that they have options. That's what people do in negotiations. Right? There's a time element here. The date is set for New York City. Eddie Hearn doesn't want any possible opponent thinking that they're getting any kind of leverage by delaying a response to an offer. Right? So as I see it, right, I still think the best possible opponents, even in New York City, for a fight against Anthony Joshua would be Dylan White and Luis Ortiz. I don't believe either guy is sitting around thinking about dodging Anthony Joshua. These men want to be champion. Not only that, Joshua has had problems in fights. Didn't Carlos Tackham go several rounds against him? I don't care what the judges thought about the opening rounds to the Joshua Povetkin fight. I'm just telling you, Povetkin was holding his own. Povetkin had some moments in the opening rounds of his fight against Anthony Joshua, didn't he? Right, Dylan White's been in the ring with Anthony Joshua before. Dylan White was negotiating to have a rematch. He's not boycotting Joshua. He doesn't view Joshua as unbeatable. Not only that, why would a guy want just one of these alphabet organization belts when you have a cash cow over here with multiple belts? So, I'm not buying the, these fighters are asking for too much, right? When they're literally being offered less than a third of what Josh was making in the bout. Think about it. This is supposed to be Joshua's big splash in the United States. It's a big event. Right? Something tells me Joshua could live with making $25 million off this fight. Giving the other guy an extra $5 million just to get it done, especially when the other guy would provide a basis of comparison between Joshua and Deontay Wilder. Right? Luis Ortiz has already fought Wilder. Theoretically, if Ortiz fought Joshua and got destroyed by Joshua, that would really enhance Joshua's reputation with the boxing public. So forgive me. I think this is just hardball negotiations. Um, I think Luis Ortiz would love to fight Anthony Joshua. I don't believe Ortiz is afraid of Joshua in the slightest. But I think Ortiz understands that being a fighter in his late 30s, if he loses to Joshua, Joshua's a knockout puncher. Only one guy's gone the distance with Joshua. If he loses by KO to Joshua, let's be realistic. That would be the end of his career. This would be his last big payday. He wants to make sure it's as big as possible. Understand, too, in boxing, it really is every man for themselves. Does anyone really think that Luis Ortiz is talking to Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder, and they're agreeing to freeze Joshua out? No, Joshua froze himself out. Right? Wilder wanted to fight Joshua. I know there's a Joshua crowd saying, hey, you should have taken the offer and stuff like that. I myself am wondering why Wilder didn't take the zone offer. But you're kidding yourself. 
if you think that Wilder has convinced other elite fighters to not sign to fight Anthony Joshua, no, that's not the way it works. Wilder has his hands full against Dominique Brazil, who, by the way, lost to Joshua and would love, like Dylan White, to have another opportunity at Joshua. Right? The guys who have lost to Joshua don't leave the ring feeling that they've lost to prime Mike Tyson. Right? The guys who lost to Tyson weren't out there demanding a rematch against Tyson. Right? Marvis Fraser wasn't saying, I want a rematch against Mike Tyson. No, 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 no. They were too beaten up to do that. That's not the case with Anthony Joshua. Even in fights that he wins convincingly. Right? The Dylan White fight, let's face it, Dylan White stopped in that fight. The Dominique Brazil fight, Dominique Brazil has stopped in that fight. Both of those guys, I'm sure, are replaying the fights in their head. And they realize they made mistakes. Right? Vladimir Klitschko was talking about wanting a comeback. Right? I'm sure Vladimir Klitschko is replaying his fight with Joshua in his head. And he's thinking, hey, you know what? I'd like to do that again. I didn't see Vladimir Klitschko with that attitude after he got shellacked by Corey Sanders. Right? You remember how that turned out. Vladimir never fights him again. Never. His brother fights him, not Vladimir. Right? So, no, I don't buy the folks are dodging Anthony Joshua. I think Joshua is very talented. I think Joshua is one of the big stories in boxing right now. I think the zone picked a great fighter to help build their network. In fact, two great fighters, Canelo and Joshua, right? I think guys are chomping at the bit to fight both. But guys want to be paid at least a third of what Joshua was making in a fight. When the heavyweight champion calls you up because he needs a dance partner because his original dance partner turns out to have failed multiple drug tests. Right? Some guys are going to say, okay, well, look, I need at least a third of what you're making. Right? It'd be different if Josh was making $10 million for the fight. He's making 30. Big money. Let's shift gears. Let's talk about Daniel Dubois, right? He just fought a guy, Richard Larte. I have the fight in my favorites folder right now. Just some constructive comments on him. I believe round three of this fight, if you follow Triple D's career, right? I think round three of this fight is one of the most significant rounds that the boys has had. Right? There's a moment there where he gets lured into a shootout with Richard Lardy. And you notice his defense falls apart a little bit. Let's talk about, as layman, what he can work on for future fights. Right? You know, the first thing, in my opinion, and he looked good in a fight, got the fourth round stoppage. But the first thing he needs to work on, especially being a KO puncher, is he needs to work on preventing an opponent from holding him. Right? You're a guy getting an opponent in trouble. Right? Richard Lardy starts holding the boy as if the boy's his wife. Right? He's in trouble. He needs to buy time. He's holding. Now, some guys will make sure the ref knows the other guy's holding. Carl Frotch used to have his hands wide apart. To let the ref, the judges, the crowd know, look, I'm not the one holding on here. What I prefer is the Mike McCallum, Gennady Golovkin approach, where the other guy is struggling. He wants to hold you. And these guys have a way of having their hands extended in such a way where you can't grab them. Right, Lardy's able to grab Dubois around the shoulders. That shouldn't happen. Dubois should be the kind of guy who has his hands swollen out 
so that as the guy tries to grab him, he can either knock the hand down, duck away, or just push the guy away. Right? You're a young, heavy hitting heavyweight. You don't want to give guys extra time to recover in fights. I thought the ball gave Lardy extra time. The second thing I'd love for him to work on, and he's a young guy, is he needs to vary his attack a little bit. He's coming in behind a jab. Good for him, right? Let's hope he sharpens that jab a little bit, right? But that jab keeps Lardy outside, and then, of course, the boy is able to throw things over the jab. That's great. But I hope he looks at Canelo films. Right? At times, you don't want to lead with a jab. You want to come in with hooks. When the other guy's expecting a jab, you need an element of surprise. You should lead with hooks. David Hay. Right? Come in with, with, with big home run shots. Let the other guy know, look, it might be a jab. It might be a hook. Mix it up a little bit. Dubois, I think, here, early in his career, is playing it safe. It's predominantly a jab. When he got into the hooks, he got hit with some shots back. Let me also say, too, his feet are a little bit wide apart. Tells you the pace of the fight he likes. He's very structured. Right? The burden is on the rest of the world to jump inside his comfort zone, to force him onto his back. Foot. We didn't really see him in this fight on his back foot a lot. When I see a guy who has wide feet, Adrian Broder, for example, I always wonder, gee, what would happen if an opponent gets them out of their stance? Will they still have power on their punches? Will they be able to operate backing away? I think that's an open question on Daniel Dubois. Right? Let me also say, too. The boss so reliant on that lead jab that you wonder what happens if an opponent can duck the jab or play a space game, be too far outside to get hit with the jab, and then be able to suddenly jump there. The kind of opponent who right now, in my opinion, would be too dangerous for Dubois would be former heavyweight champion, former Olympic gold medalist, Alexander Povetkin. By the way, another excellent scout on Anthony Joshua's resume. Right? Understand, Joshua has a pretty good jab. Didn't get, Povetkin didn't get hit with it that much when they fought. Because Povetkin, even with a big guy like Joshua, was able to be outside and then jump inside. What cost Prevetkin in that fight is that Joshua, over time, makes the adjustment. He has Prevetkin jump into a short right hand. Right? The question here is whether Triple D can make the adjustment. Let's say he's shooting a jab and the other guy moves too well. He's outside the jab and stuff like that which is what Prevetkin does, right? What's the boy's plan B? Let's say Prevetkin then jumps in. He was able to jump in on a big puncher in Joshua, lands a shot on Joshua's chin early in that fight. Let's say Prevetkin jumps in, gets inside, catches the boy unprepared with wide legs, a wide stance. The jab's gone because Povetkin's inside the jab. How does Dubois react? I believe right now it's an open question. We got a hint of a possible answer in round three. What happened was Richard Lardy here gets hurt. Everyone in the arena thought he was hurt. As the fight continues, Dubois then got a little brave. Lardy, of course, was playing possum a little bit, had a lot of fight in him, starts throwing hooks back. Right? There's a moment there 
where the ball was outside of his construct. Got hit with a shot. It looked like the fight could slip into a shootout where the ball would have given away his boxing advantages. I think the third round is worth looking at. I think the fourth round is worth looking at. I hope you do so. Dubois is a young guy, had success as an amateur. It's awfully hard. Will soon be making a legitimate claim on the throne. He's maybe a year, 18 months away, right? I think it's time for all of us to do our homework on this young British fighter. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.